Good evening. My name is Johanna Kolyanen and you are watching Crosstalks, a collaboration between two of Sweden's leading universities, Stockholm University and KTH, the Royal Institute of Technology. Do join us in discussing today's topics on Twitter, where our handle is Crosstalks TV and our hashtag is Crosstalks. Access to clean energy is one of the modern world's most fundamental challenges. It is both a central part of, our part of our struggle to create a more sustainable world and a cause of political conflict and wars. While unsustainable energy sources are peaking, nuclear power remains controversial, new greener energy sources are gathering momentum, though not without their own problems and challenges. How can we meet future needs for power and energy efficiency? What are the most interesting technologies, projects and policies? How will the quest for energy affect the political and economic landscape? With me to discuss these questions are Thomas Jonter, Professor of International Relations at the Department of Economic History, Stockholm University. Semida Silveira, Professor in Energy Systems Planning, KTH Royal Institute of Technology. And Henrik Berisocker, Assistant Professor and Researcher at the Department of Fusion Plasma Physics, KTH Royal Institute of Technology. Please give them a warm welcome. So, Thomas, you're a professor in international relations and economic history, and you've studied nuclear energy and energy security. Why is the access to energy an important area of study for social sciences? Well, first of all, I don't think if you put an energy production system in place, it's not just about research and development investments, technical investments. It's also, you do that in a political, societal context. I would say it's a techno-political system, not just an energy system. So uh, in order to be successful or unsuccessful, unsuc you could also fail in doing that, uh, you need to take into account uh, a, a number of aspects. Uh, first of all, uh, politicians have to take decisions, uh, and decision makers need basic information, figures, facts, in data. And uh, it's not just technical data, because uh, an uh, energy uh, production system will have impact on a society on a regional uh, basis, also on a national and also uh, global basis. So uh, it has impact on how you build houses, how you see the planners or planning for new cities, building of smart uh, houses, how we uh, transport, transport each other. Uh, so it's a number of societal uh, aspects that have to be taken into account. And also, uh, legally, I mean, you have to regulate uh, energy system, uh, legislation. Uh, you, you mentioned uh, nuclear power is very controversial today. Yes, but it's heavily regulated. Uh, just certain operators uh, is uh, allowed to do that. And they have to follow international legislation. Uh, IEA taking control, have uh, international inspectors coming, for instance, to Sweden to check that's not doing bad things and so on and so forth, and the national legislation. So we need a number of competences to put an uh, energy production system or upgrade an old energy system. I'd, I'd like to follow that up with almost a yes or no question. Do you think, in that case, because this was a very good answer, are there enough social scientists looking at at these kinds of technological fields like energy production today? A very good question. I would say not enough good social scientists. <laughs> <laughs> no, very good. Now that's an inspiration for our students in the audience. Uh, Samira Silvera, you, your work focuses on multiple dimensions of energy systems transformation and uh, global challenges such as climate change and sustainable development. I'm starting to realize that follows up very well on what mm -hmm. we just heard. Now, what are the issues that you find most interesting in your field right now? Well, uh, we are moving towards a new paradigm, the paradigm of sustainability. Uh, we are more aware of uh, the impacts of uh, energy harnessing and using in our society. Uh, we are also much more aware, I would say, of the value added that comes with energy. And uh, at the same time, we have different technological solutions that we can use. And these together, I think, uh, brings opportunities for, for thinking the energy solution in society in a very different way. Uh, we are just beginning to see those transformations, and I think it's going to be very interesting. 
uh, although perhaps quite difficult because we have to plan it differently. So when, when you are saying thinking about them in a different way, do you mean thinking about them in a sort of ecosystem sense almost, as was, as, as, as was just described, or do you mean that we would use different kinds of technologies? Well, I think uh, actually it's both in a way, but uh, personally I'm not so focused on the technology itself. I have uh, full respect for the for the... Uh, technology. Otherwise, I wouldn't be able to work in a technical university. <laughs> but uh, uh, that's only part of the solution. I agree uh, very much uh, with what Thomas said, uh, because uh, um, we have to make some choices. And also, the, when making these choices, we can make very different choices today than we were able to do before. At the same time, we have this pressing uh, issue of climate change, pushing for us to make decisions as, fa as soon as possible. So it is not only about we are going to be more sustainable over time, but uh, the climate change agenda puts a kind of a time schedule for that. And that's a very Push urgent time yeah, schedule as well. So excellent. the decisions need to be made sooner than we would like to. Absolutely. I think scientists uh, and people who are interested in science, like myself, I think we, we always say, well, it would be very nice to do some 20 additional years of studying on this before we decide. But we don't have 20 years. These decisions need to be made now. Exactly. Made now. And we, I think we should go away from the thought that we will have the ultimate solution. We are not going to have the ultimate solution. We, the, the development is a moving target. Also, development of technology is a moving target. So the day we are implementing something, then we already have a glimpse of something new coming. Yes. And uh, so we cannot wait for all the answers before we have to move on, because development is not waiting. I, I felt that, that, yes, we were moving very well into, because there might be an ultimate solution coming. Uh, I think we need to do all of these other changes first, because it's not here tomorrow. Henrik, your work is in nuclear fusion. Uh, and that has been around as a potential future power source for a very long time. I, I seem to remember that. More than 20 years ago, when I was in school, I was told, any, any day now, soon, we will, ha we will have answers. Uh, it's been very promising for quite some time, so to speak, providing we can make this technology work. It's not yet ready for use. Could you tell us how far are we from, from nuclear fusion um, in, 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 in casual use? Uh, how far are we from, yes. from technological success? Well, uh, you're absolutely right that uh, it's been talked about and worked on for a long time and it's been um, sold as a future uh, solution. It has a great potential as a sustainable base support for a base energy source. It's got, uh, we have uh, availability of fuel for millions of years. Uh, there isn't any waste problem in the same way as with fission power. And there isn't any risk of catastrophic uh, disasters. So uh, the, the thing is that when work started in the 1950s, 60s, it looked much easier than it turned out to be. The main line of research is uh, heating an ionized or ionized gas of hydrogen up to very high temperatures, 200 million degrees or something like that, and confine it with a magnetic field. And it turned out that the, this is such a com complex system that it was more difficult than people thought originally. So it took a long time to solve the so plasma physics problems there. Excuse me, did you just say 200 million degrees? Yes. Okay, that is uh, a very high temperature. Yes, no, that doesn't sound entirely easy for me. Yeah, it's uh, but uh, ten, that ten, is solved 20 now. times higher temperature than in the center of the sun. But, but it's, uh, of course, it's a very small uh, volume and it's not uh, very dense matter in there. Anyway, uh, this Basic uh, plasma physics problems, I think, are well understood now. I, actually, 20 years ago or something like that, uh, I think it's fair to say that it's been shown that, that uh, fusion works, that one can get energy out of it more than, than we put in. Uh, but uh, the situation now is that uh, uh, the European community has decided on a roadmap for fusion that really establishes the uh, deadlines that need to be met in order to uh, uh, make a fusion reactor option available. And that's a very good thing because that's been lacking before. And we have a clear plan on, on how to reach there. So uh, the first step now is that there is an international uh, test facility 
being built in the south of France either. And that's going to be operating around 2020. It's going to, uh, it's planned to uh, produce uh, 500 megawatts of fusion power. Uh, and uh, with that would be with 50 megawatts of input. So it, it uh, gets 10 times more energy out than, than put in. And this research facility is going to be used to, to work on engineering types of problems which remain to be solved. Uh, the, the things that, that need to be done are, it's necessary to um, find out exactly what size a uh, uh, fusion reactor should be and how it should be operated in an efficient way. There are a number of engineering types so problems that need to be solved in particular materials problems having to do with very high heat loads on, on uh, surfaces and with uh, radiation damage to construction materials. So uh, the plan is to study this with this international collaborative device and then as a single step then to get to the stage where there could be commercial fusion reactors built there is going to be a, a, another big machine built probably designed starting 2030 and it would be operating uh, by early 2040 and in this case it's the, the, the idea is that it should be delivering some few hundred megawatts of electric power to the grid. So when we get to 2048-2050 uh, there should be an alternative where reasonable technical solutions have been found and, uh, and where there is a good idea of the economy because what it all boils down to is actually the cost of uh, electricity from fusion power that um, we will. Yeah. I think a lot, I mean, if you're sitting in the audience now, on average, uh, you are a student and you will think, well, 2040, that is pretty far in the future. I think if you are sitting on the stage, you are on average older and we can tell you that 20, 2040 will be any day now. It's very, very soon. So also, if you're in material sciences, what an exciting thing to get involved with. This is going to be like a space program and in practical terms, perhaps much more um, important for, for humanity. Uh, I don't know exactly how to balance now, because of course this is very exciting. It's a, it's a wonderful vision. We all want it to come true. Would that solve our problems then, well, Samira? Well, I think that, uh, actually uh, what Henrik just said confirmed a little bit uh, what I said. I mean, we, w we are of course moving the frontier all the time in what solutions we can offer. But, uh, I mean, until 2040, 2050, people will still need to have electricity, people will still need to develop, people will need energy. And uh, what we will, are we going to do uh, to, to pro provide that energy? So what happens is that we are moving the frontier all the time, and meanwhile you have also tracks that we are used to follow, and they tend to stay. So you need to mobilize, like uh, this case, you have to mobilize the, the society to actually make it happen. It would not happen without a, a major mobilization of the, the, the research community and of the decision makers to actually say, no, we're going to build this. We're going to make it happen. So for in 100 years time, maybe this has been disseminated far, far enough, but uh, in, in between, we need to have other alternatives. Thomas Yanta. Yeah, I would follow up on that. I think you're absolutely right. And, uh, and I, I think Henrik is uh, working on very important issues, research issues. Um, and I think technically uh, you're right, and in the future it's possible to have that solution. But once again, we should not forget the political uh, societal context here. And, and you're right, it costs enormous of uh, uh, capital to put that in place, to make it... Uh, marketable to work functioning uh, in a daily basis and we need uh, a lot of uh, heavy investments remember when nuclear power for instance we could have different views on uh, the good uh, to use uh, if it's good to use nuclear power or not but it was uh, uh, subsidized from the governments all over the world in United States in Sweden and uh, heavy investments and R&D uh, industry could, so to speak, have a lot of long-term plans. Mm -hmm. uh, today we have a different view on that. Uh, everything should stand on its own leg. It should be paid by the market itself. 
So in that and sense, the market we have to is change. heavily in, invested in, in old systems, so yeah. it's not very much in their interest to find something that's essentially free energy. They cannot energy. afford it, cannot afford it. I mean, here we talk about risk is too high. hundreds yeah. of billions of investments. If, even in the case of success, the risk is too high. Yeah. And in the case of success, yeah. of course, you also uh, 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 destroy all your existing yeah. business models. Uh, as well. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm wondering, do you think we can even accurately predict uh, energy needs uh, in the future? Will, we need, will humanity need more or less energy? Of course. Um, we can and we cannot, I would say, if <laughs> I can start. Uh, uh, first of all, we have to carry on uh, doing analysis and so on and so forth, but we have to distinguish between short-term prospects and medium-term and long-term. Um, Short terms, we know that we're going to be more people on this planet. Today we are, uh, roughly speaking, 7 billion people here on this planet. And demographers have different views what's going to take uh, part in the uh, demographic growth pictures in the future. But they are, uh, most of, the majority of them agree that we will have at least 9, between 9 and 10 billion people on this planet 20, 30 years from now. That means there are more and more people on this planet, but also more people that will consume more because we, at the same time, see an economic takeoff in, 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 in the regions of the world where we used to call the third world, like in Asia, Latin America, uh, and Africa. And they, of course, uh, will produce uh, more products, and that means more energy. So in that sense, we know that we need more energy. Having said that, Technically, innovation could build smarter systems, smarter houses uh, that, that leads, needs less energy to heat uh, and so on and so forth. But still, in 20, 25 years uh, prospect, uh, we know we know. But then we're talking about 50, 70 years from now, it's very hard to make Similar, predictions. Yeah. yeah, I think you're right that, of course, we know that the population is increasing and you have a kind of a pretty much a good idea and good good methods to, to calculate uh, when, when the turn will come. Uh, but at the same time, I think we need to think a little bit differently because for many years, uh, IEA was doing this uh, uh, evaluation of long-term uh, evaluation of energy demand, and it, it gave the impression that it could grow forever. And it would grow forever. There will be resources forever. Uh, maybe... If, as much as we, we will live many generations, we can say the sun will shine forever, but not even the sun will shine forever. But okay, let's say it will shine forever. From, from a human perspective, yes. let's say yeah. it will shine forever. Yes. Exactly. And then, uh, but uh, the pro the, the, the eventually, this, uh, they were asked to make a scenario that would give us at least a hint of what we need to do to do it differently. And I think that's how we need to think. It's not like, of course, it, if we don't do anything, we will eventually, we will destroy ourselves. It has happened before. Other civilizations have done it before us. Yeah. They didn't pay attention and they destroyed their own uh, society. Uh, but uh, knowing the, the, the limits that we have in terms of natural resources, knowing also that in the, in previously we didn't pay so much attention on how much actually we waste of, of, of energy, not paying attention that actually we could have put much more effort in exploring the energy that is in the sun. Mm -hmm. We have put efforts in other places. We have put much, if you look at the research agendas over the past decades, most of the resources have gone to either fossil fuel related research, uh, research or uh, uh, nuclear power re related uh, uh, research. Mm -hmm. So it was no wonder, it's only in the, in the last few decades that we started looking more into technologies for conversion uh, in, uh, in with using renewables, but with a much less, much lower budget. That's very clear. Uh, and we're still yeah. putting a lot of effort in, in, in those areas. So I think we need to review a little bit the agenda of research or, on energy. I think we will get back to that point. Uh, yes. Later. I think now joining us via Skype, uh, calling in from Switzerland, I believe, uh, is Dr. Arthur Wellinger, technical coordinator for the Bioenergy Agreement of the International Energy Agency, IEA. Welcome to Crosstalks. Thank you. Welcome to you. <laughs> uh, and now, Dr. Wellinger, you're working with bioenergy in different forms. Yes. Um, what are the most interesting or promising technologies uh, in your field as you see it? 
Sorry, that's the wrong question. Okay, <laughs> tell me the question and then you can answer it. <laughs> I mean, uh, you just introduced the renewable energies. I mean, first of all, battery energy is not the only renewable energy and uh, it, it, has a, it has a good deal to cover over the next uh, years to come. But, of course, we talk about solar energy, we talk about wind energy, we talk about wave energy, and so on and so on. So we have to look at the whole of it. And, and I think uh, from the answers of my colleagues uh, who are uh, with you in the same room, um, it, it becomes clear that we cannot say this is the solution and that is not the solution. So what we have to do is we have to use as soon as possible all available technologies and should not stop doing research for future technologies. I think you mentioned that. So this is just as an introduction. So as I say, um, uh, bioenergy uh, over the next uh, few years, and when I say a few years, uh, IEA is looking forward to 2050, and that's the most we can do, and still this is high, highly risky. Mm. But uh, they d do have the models up to 2050, and uh, until that time, bioenergy plays uh, an important role uh, I don't want to give you now the energy figures because nobody knows what it is, exitutes. But <laughs> anyway, it's a lot. It's up to a third of, of new energy that uh, bioenergy can provide, depending on the scenario. So what is the uh, advantage of, uh, of uh, bioenergy? Um, it's a whole range of, of, of energy. So it, it, covers, uh, it covers all type of, of plant grown on this planet, um, it should not uh, compete with uh, with uh, nutrition for mankind, and it should not compete with feed for animals. And um, so, but we cannot look at bioenergy alone. We have to look at the whole biomass production, and that's that's the uh, the difficult thing. If you talk about wind, you talk about a technical a technical solution. If you do a look about PV, photovoltaics, you look at the single technical solution. Uh, biomass, bioenergy is depending on a lot of things. So you cannot separate biomass for energy and for food and for feed. It's all in one. And we need all of the, those three. So when we talk about energy production, we should also talk about food production. And in fact, this is, uh, this is improving altogether. Only the discussion is, is, is uh, separated into these different things. So at the IEA, we try to, to, to think more and more integrated. Integrated means we talk about biorefineries, where you can use several times the same biomass. At the end, uh, um, at the low value products, which is actually energy, and to start with, you use the high product um, biomass, um, giving paints, giving chemicals, giving whatever. Um, so I, we look at the whole range. Can I ask so you, Dr. Winter? Is, Sorry. Uh, yeah. I, because Professor Silver was just saying that, that we have perhaps uh, both the mainstream of the research field and IEA itself indeed have committed rather late uh, to bioenergy, for instance, to re and to, to renewables. Uh, would you say now that, that that shift has happened? For instance, does, is the International Energy Agency completely committed uh, to bioenergy as a strategy? <laughs> I mean, uh, IEA uh, has recognized that the renewable energies are playing a major role until 2050. That's for sure. But they do not say that the other energies should be left out. No, we will have at least until 2030, 2040, we will live on oil primarily. Mm -hmm. And we still, unfortunately, will still will use a lot of coal. And I say unfortunately because this, this is the heaviest CO2 emission uh, problem. But anyway, we still need it because we don't have all the solutions yet. But we have every year has to cut down the use of fossil fuels. And I think that is clearly recognized by IEA. But do you agree that there is a that there is a no? Let's let me rephrase that. There are systemic challenges to this shift that needs to happen because of entrenched interests and also tradition and just the general difficulty of sort of inertia. It's very difficult to think in 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 new ways. What are the big challenges there, uh, Dr. Wellinger? In in shifting towards a more more sustainable energy production system. Well, <laughs> it starts with politics. Uh, before it was mentioned that uh, uh, politics has to 
play an important role. I would fully agree to that. But unfortunately, politicians are elected only uh, at the longest every fourth year. So they think in terms of four years, and that's not long enough. So that's one of the problems we have to overcome. And then another thing which has been mentioned, and which is true for all energies, industry cannot invest in all types of energies at the same time to the, to the amount it would be needed, unless they are, are the time, they have the time to recover the money by selling this type of energy. Yeah. And this is also at the same time a political problem because politicians, when they change the policy uh, every fourth or every fifth year, then they don't get enough income to pay the development. So this is all interlinked. So these are really major challenges. And then there is a huge challenge when I talk about biomass, which is best agricultural practice. And this has nothing to do with energy. This is an old, very old problem. Yeah. The developed world never managed to educate the developing world how to grow best their crop under their climatic conditions. Yes. Unfortunately, these climatic conditions get more and more severe. I mean, we're running out of water. That's probably before we run out of energy, we run out of water. Yes, and, and this I, is all linked to... I, I, I would not like to add to that, of course, that one of the effects of uh, extreme uh, weather events that are very likely to come is that we will need more heating and more cooling. So, so in itself, climate change also might become a driver of, of energy need. I'd, I'd just like to make this even more complicated by adding one uh, an additional aspect. Uh, Samita, you've spoken about about the 20% of the world's population who don't currently uh, have electricity. Is it, why is it important to bring them on board? Well, uh, the benefit, the, the wealth in the world has increased and we have achieved enormous changes in terms of life quality. But unfortunately, 20% of the population is still, or more, actually more, but 20% when it comes to electricity has not uh, ha had the, the privilege of having that. And we know that electricity is entry point for a number of new steps in the development process. Uh, and we know also that uh, even, I mean, we, we, we can immediately think of the need of electricity for industrialization, but not only that, also for health. The Human Development Index in almost doubles, in some places triples, with just a small increase in, in, in energy availability, particularly uh, electricity, because then you have access to vaccines, you can actually have a better uh, health care. Uh, not to, to mention education. So life longevity, uh, infant mortality decreases, life longevity uh, increases. And uh, so it is our responsibility in terms of if we talk about global justice, it's our responsibility. And the, the big challenge is to, to, to actually put in place the mechanisms that will make that happen. Thomas, would you like to come in here? Sure, I agree. I agree. And uh, Dr. Wellinger uh, explained it uh, in a very good way. It's not just about energy, it's about it's a water, water security, it's scarcity of water. Uh, it's climate change linked into that as well. Foods, food security uh, and energy. So it's interlinked and we, we cannot just solve one uh, aspect of the whole problem at a time. We have to tackle it in a wholeness. Uh, so I think it's it's very important. Well, do you agree that politics is is the key? Because then then I think we're all in trouble. If I mean, <laughs> I, I, then I'm not sure it's a no. solvable problem because because we're not going to change the structure of of, of elective democracy in time to solve this problem. People will be re-elective every four years yeah. or every six years, depending on the country. So so we need to find a way to to speak on longer. Time scales. Yeah, but I think it's about raising the awareness. Uh, and uh, Dr. Welling is right. As, uh, normally, uh, uh, you sit, you have power in four years, uh, sometimes even just three years. But on the other hand, we see certain decisions taken uh, that go beyond just uh, four years' time. Uh, if it, I think we should take this climate change debate that we had for. Uh, um, around 10 years now as something serious. And that means it's an obligation not just for sitting in power five years, it's go beyond that. So we have to be able uh, to uh, take decision with, you know, uh, that look into the future. 
And that means we have, just, we have to work on an international level, involve international organization, region organization, uh, to, so to speak, strengthen the system, not to just to be uh, an issue that the political party or one uh, s government is taking care of. We have to see it in a broader way. Uh, am, I, am I right in thinking that, your, that some of your research has to do with, uh, with nuclear power in the context of the Cold War, specifically? Uh, it used to be, yes. yes. Uh, now I'm trying to look into yeah, the Because I was time, thinking, eh? Eh? then at least, eh? these, these eh? technological advances were placed in a sort of ideological context that yes. involved, that citizens could in some sense identify with. Perhaps we need some kind of ideology that, is, that we would like to survive as a species, which I think is a message that is mm. relatively easy to get behind, and organize in some manner that, mm. does, that would be bigger than short-term mm. politics. Mm. Uh, do you, uh, in, with your historical context, do you believe in this as a strategy? Uh, unfortunately, uh, I, I, would, would, I would love to say yes, but uh, we live in a different time, yeah. a different uh, uh, circumstances. I mean, during the Cold War, uh, we had two superpowers, United States and Soviet Union. They controlled each other, and they, so to speak, controlled one part of the world. Today, after the Cold War, uh, we don't have two superpowers. We have uh, uh, new superpowers, or at least great powers, like China with ambition to be superpowers. We have uh, Brazil, India, and so on and so forth. In a different world, a multipolar world. So in that sense, it's harder today. And also, I would say, because of the uh, emergent need for not just energy, uh, water, resources. Some yeah. researchers talk about resource war. I think it's sometimes exaggerated. But I think we could talk about a new axis of conflict today. Okay, during the Cold War, it was about ideo ideologies, uh, power, different political systems. And of course, we have that kind of political games today as well. But also, energy uh, and resources are new aspects, and I think the scarcity of it, so to speak, could lead to conflict. And we have seen it yeah. has led to conflict with Russia, involvement in Ukraine, the uh, occupation of Crimea, and so on and so forth. So, of course, it plays a role. It, it does strike me, Henrik, that, of course, you're the only person here who is literally working on a very long-term plan. Do, do you have a reflection on, on what's just been said? Well, uh, <coughs> uh, at this stage, actually, from very early on, uh, there's been a lot of international collaboration around fusion research. I mean, there was a good uh, climate, uh, collaborative climate already between the Western world and the Soviet Union at the, at the time. Uh, and uh, this ITER project is something that's an uh, example of um, really wide uh, international collaboration. This uh, experiment is, is uh, being uh, pursued by uh, uh, Europe, uh, the United States, Russia, China, Japan, Korea, and uh, India. And uh, I think uh, maybe it serves as an example of... I mean, that this has many drawbacks, of course. It's uh, not... Nobody thinks that uh, this makes things go faster or cheaper or anything, but uh, I think it's... Uh, there are... Um, positive aspects about this collaboration also that uh, that uh, everybody really participates and, uh, and uh, gets mm -hmm. the know-how and so on. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, I, I want this time perspectives. I think that, for example, we are forming consortia to work in the cities. I mean, if you want to transform the city, you have to actually have many stakeholders uh, participating and you also have the, to have the city functioning all the time. So transforming a city is very difficult and very complicated, and it requires long term. And yet the cities are transformed. How? I mean, sometimes very radically. Uh, so I think it is, uh, yes, the, uh, I wouldn't push too hard on this idea that, that politicians only four, have four years, because otherwise soon there will be groups saying that, well, let's leave them there for a longer period, and I don't think that would be a better solution. <laughs> <laughs> I would prefer the, that we continue with the shift. Instead, I would think that if we have other types of stakeholders that have a different time perspective, like, for example, the researchers, like Henrik, like other researchers, in, this, in the university, we have a different uh, agenda. For example, we have to educate educate the students, we have to do research, and our time, uh, time perspective is different than the, the political. Mm -hmm. And it's also different from the companies, because the companies, their, their time schedule is even shorter than In the politicians. It's increasingly short now. Yes. It used to be, at least, exactly. about long term, but not so much Yeah, now. and then there are all the individuals 
because people are also individuals and, and are making choices. And their perspective can be different depending on which their generation they belong to. So I think that multiplicity of, of, of participants in the process, it makes it more complex, yes, more difficult, yes. But as you say, now we have multiple superpowers or multiple candidates to power. And that gives a, that is also the, the, the effect of democracy. And as we also use technology to, in, to, to enclose, um, to bring more people, so to, to, to bring more people to the, to, to the pool, it will not be less complicated. Of course it will not. Yeah, but it will be a, a possibility also for the people to also work in their own environment. I don't think everything is a scale, because in, in history we have had different periods of, of development and sometimes more globalization. This is not the first time in history we have globalization. Of course, with different types of perspectives and technologies, mm -hmm. but mercantilism was really globalized. Yeah. So I think that, uh, but it's still, you have had also periods with very local. So we have seen in Europe a lot of globalization, preoccupation with the role of Europe in the globe, but also at the same time, a lot of local initiatives. In the energy, we have the subsidi uh, subsidiary system in energy. So countries, we have a common agenda, but we also can do it differently in different I, countries. I, I'm just going to ask a very layman, a layman's question that might come across as incredibly naive in the light of all the complexities we've, we've just sketched out. Let's say that fusion is, well, well, since fusion is one of the most promising technologies uh, for, for, the, for the future. Ah, Dr. Wellinger is shaking his head. I, know, I take note, but, but let's just put it out there as a possibility. Couldn't we just focus the world's resources? I guess, the, Henrik, this question is to you. If, if we gave this project, this infrastructure, if we poured more resources in it, could the results come faster? Or, or is the time frame about just this is how long research takes, and it's not a resource issue, really? Uh, well, uh, firstly, I think it would be naive to think that uh, there is some wonder solution that, that uh, can, uh, can do everything. I think we necessarily will have a mix of energy sources and so on. Uh, secondly, I think uh, this time schedule I mentioned uh, is, uh, I think it's too late to, uh, to do anything faster at this point because uh, these things will take time, these materials, tests and this develop. And they, and they actually designing and constructing such big plants uh, always takes a long time. So I think it, it's not, uh, it can't be shortened at this point, I think, very much. I think it could have been uh, kind of started up maybe 10 or 15 years earlier. And, uh, and one of the reasons it wasn't is that the, these uh, complications with, uh, for example, ether, there was a long discussion where to build it, if in Japan, in Europe, or, or, and so on, and how to divide the costs and so on. So there was a long period of, uh, of, such, um, of that sort of, of problems. I think uh, it could have been done faster then. On the other hand, as I said, it's a valuable thing with this collaboration because it may make everybody more prepared to to uh, go for it when it's uh, when, yeah, when, so when the we are collaboration to build these future reactors at 2050, then yes. maybe we get this, that time back. So the, cre the, the collaboration creates a sense of ownership that might actually make the political processes easier uh, in implementation. Then I have to follow up on that head on that uh, uh, at, uh, on the protest there from from uh, Dr. Wellinger. Uh, you were perhaps shaking your head a little bit at the idea of fusion being being the future, or did I read you correctly? No, I, I have something against when you say, I mean, Henrik uh, uh, told you that already, there is not the single best way, uh, also not with fusion. And even though uh, Henrik is targeting for 2050 or even longer, it, I think this is still a very short period for that particular technology. I remember in the 70s, in the late 70s, uh, I heard the first... Uh, contributions about fusion and then they said it, it will last 50 years before the first full-size plant will be built and since then I hear every year it will last 50 years now I hear again 25 years and I don't know so I don't doubt that at one stage you will get there but don't make promises you can't keep that's not good towards the politicians uh, because I'm a, I'm a layman but from what I understand from my colleagues you're really walking at the very edge of possible technologies. So it's no wonder that it takes time. It's, it's, I fully understand that. And if you, but ask for the time. Ask 
steadily for the time and don't make promises. I think that's an important message. Well, uh, first, would you like to respond, or do you think it was a fair assessment? Mm. No, I think uh, that's uh, true, I suppose. I mean, uh, there was a lot of uh, premature optimism in the beginning in particular. But uh, I don't think, I don't feel that it's too unrealistic at this point with such a time schedule. It won't be the optimal solution, surely. So more resources could uh, help in, um, I mean, mm. it, it's, uh, it's also, it it's, uh, has been this... Uh, political things, but there has also been uh, some um, different opinions on uh, what kinds of solutions to choose to develop. So now there has been a choice, which is uh, the one that was more most advanced, maybe 20 years ago. But it's not uh, obvious that this is uh, ultimately the really best solution. I think uh, what we will... Uh, see is that it uh, may be good enough. And I think that also reflects the maturity uh, of the field. That's a, 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 another positive result of the fact that it takes, of it takes longer. But then I'd like to expand this question again. So we agree that international collaboration and, and these kind of big structured projects can, can make amazing achievements. So, so should, we, should we have even more of these consortia? Should, is there any field? Okay, if, if you could just choose one field in the energy sector, where you would, could pour a lot of resources into, re, into research right now. Is there an answer to that question, what it should be? Should it be bioenergy, uh, Thomas? Yeah, but I, I think, first of all, we have to understand uh, different countries have different views on this, and they have different uh, conditions. They have different possibilities. We could take a country like Norway, for example, they have a lot of hydropower. It's not any big interest of going into fusion technology. Of course, they have researchers doing this because they have hydropower enough to live on that for probably decades, even longer, forever. And do you have countries like Sweden, which uh, between 40 and 50% of all elect electricity uh, comes from nuclear power and the rest from uh, hydropower and some wind power and so on and so forth. And you have countries like uh, Germany, who took a decision after the Fukushima accident to phase out nuclear power and instead will be dependent on coal power until 2022 when it will switch over to sustainable solution. That's at least their plan. So what I'm saying here, politics play a role and each state has its own path dependency yeah. that, so to speak, trap in the system infrastructures, R&Ds, investments, political games and so on and so forth. So it's not just, okay, we cooperate and we will fix the best system. It doesn't work like that. And, and of course, I, I do realize, it's, in a sense, it's a very foolish question because the more diverse your energy production system is, the less, uh, the less risky it is, the less sensitive it is for, for instance, hydropower. Uh, in a time of water shortages mm -hmm. and climate change, hydropower would seem long term to be a relatively risky proposition, actually. Mm -hmm. But in the short term, again, it could be a solution. But I wonder. Nevertheless, uh, your, yes. your, your suggestion that bioenergy should be more uh, looked more at, I think, is, is cor a correct assessment because uh, we have uh, uh, actually the largest majority of renewables that is used today is biomass. Uh, half of it is, um, at least half of it, is traditional biomass. That is biomass that is being used with uh, very low efficiency. And that not to mention all the biomass that we are actually not using at all, that is being just wasted. Uh, wherever you go, there is biomass in one way or another. And in the city too, there is a lot of biomass because we have a lot of organic uh, matter coming out uh, of, of, of food rests and, and all kinds. So uh, bioenergy, I think, will always play an important role, part uh, in, in the system in one way or another, because we are in a planet where we have the photosynthesis and we transform solar energy into another form and, and, and process it. So wherever you have, uh, you, as long as we need to eat, there will be crop residues. As long as we need to build houses, there will be residues of wood. As long as, as uh, we have cities and we are eating and, and as, uh, uh, we will have uh, residues of, of other things that we use that come from organic materials, then we will have also that in the cities. So actually exploring in a much more efficient way uh, the biomass that is available, besides the discussion of crops, just planting 
crops for, for biomass, for, for energy, may not be the best way of using bioenergy. But, uh, but uh, at least in the, in the short run, maybe, but in the, in the long run. To look for what's not. already in the system. Yes, but there will be Move always a, a lot in the yes, exactly. economy in a, in, mm. in a more way. Yeah, I would like to open this to the room. I wonder if there's a question. Yes, there's one right there. Uh, I would like you to move to the microphone and state your name and ask your question, please. Hello. Uh, my name is David. I'm from Australia, so forgive the accent. I ha we've spoken a lot about uh, energy generation. Is there any comments you have about energy storage? Does energy affordable and effective energy storage, does that have a good effect on uh, whether it's the global availability of energy or does that change anything in terms of the, um, yeah, the, the energy generation? That's a very good question. And, and I, I find this is something that's talked about a lot, but certainly to me it's difficult to judge the scale of the impact these kinds of solutions could have. Does anyone have an, have an answer there? Samira yeah, Samira. Well, you want to start? Really? <laughs> well, I think it's a good question, yes, because uh, as, uh, a lot of the attention has been put in the energy conversion. Uh, and now we are uh, looking a little bit more closely to storage. And as we develop uh, more understanding and more alternatives for storage, we are shaking the system, of course, we are shaking the system, so it is going to transform to have a great impact in the way we organize the energy system. Henrik Bershok. Uh, no, I, I agree, it's a, a relevant question. It's um, very important, especially if, if, uh, if you want to have a lot of um, wind power, solar power in the system because it's an uh, intermittent energy source, so then uh, storage or distributing power is uh, very important. Mm. Do we have another question from the room? Yes, please. My name is Fredrik Westerberg. Uh, I have a nuclear question. Uh, it's not a fusion question, rather the old technology. Um, so I would like to know, is there any thorium reactor ideas or uh, any comment about that? Thank you. Thank you. I don't understand the question. Does does any yes. uh, a variety of nuclear reactor related to the those we use nowadays? Very good. Thank you. Uh, uh, do you, we have a question? An answer? Yes, please. Dealing with social sciences, <laughs> uh, maybe I c maybe Henry can join me in answering as well. But yes, there are some uh, ideas and also uh, in operation somehow at least uh, on. Uh, uh, research basis in, for instance, India, mm. who's developing that techno technology. But I think uh, your question hiding another question, if it's less uh, uh, risky to use thorium, right, uh, from proliferation of Well, let's uh, assume that that is the question. Do you agree that it is? Uh, I think, uh, okay, I'm not an expert in this, okay, but uh, that, that's what I have heard at least, it's harder uh, to use thorium uh, for uh, nuclear weapons production. Of course you could use it, that's what I heard at least, but it takes more skills and R&D to mm -hmm. do that. Uh, Henrik, would you like to come in briefly? Do you have an opinion on this? Uh, no, I believe there is a lot of uh, potential, but I, I don't think I can um, comment um, well mm -hmm. on that question, really. But, but, but can yeah. I just say, yes, but it, yes, there is potential there, but I don't think it solved the problem because of nuclear material will end someday anyway, even thorium. Mm -hmm. uh, I think IEA had come to the conclusion that uh, we have uranium that will last 100 years from now if we use uh, uranium at the scale we do today. I don't know if that's an accurate figure, but uh, what I'm trying to say is more and more reactors mean more uranium to use. Okay, we could have uh, faster reactors that use less and so on and so forth, but still. We're running out of time. I'm going to have to ask you a really big question, and then I'm just going to ask each of you for a very small answer. Uh, we're, let's say that, of course, we should bring, uh, for all the reasons uh, outlined earlier, we should bring all of the developing uh, world on board and make energy accessible to all. Do these countries have to go through the same errors we have? Or, or can they hack the path and, and, and move into sort of sustainable production and consumption of energy uh, immediately? I will ask you for this final opinion. We start with you, Dr. Wellinger. Um, 
I'm afraid they're going to do it, but this is up to uh, the developed world to avoid that because uh, going making a shortcut means investing money. And as long as the Western countries don't invest enough money in developing uh, countries, uh, they're going to make the same mistakes. So it's really a question of money and politics. Very briefly, Thomas Hilton. To be very short and very unprecise. Thank you. Yeah, I, I think I agree. Uh, we need more of cooperation, uh, honest cooperation, and taking out of out of this trapped in the pet dependency. Uh, and we have to be honest. I mean, we see a lot of bad things going on in China in terms of uh, producing energy, but they also invest a lot of. Uh, financial means in solar energy and yeah. the alternative energy more than the United States, for instance, in nominal terms at least. Yeah, uh, very briefly, Sinvita Silveira. Yeah, I think that uh, um, you, you can expect that it will be different. And it is, I think it's going to be much more different than we want to believe now. Uh, because uh, we, in the same way we have seen the best... Uh, uh, way of, of comparing would be to look at the telecommunications area where you have had a penetration completely different in yes. the developing yeah. countries. And I think in energy the same thing can happen if we actually allow ourselves to think yes. this, the energy system completely differently. I'm sorry to say we run out of time, Henrik. I'm going to limit you to a yes or no answer. Okay. Do they have to make the same mistakes as we have? Uh, no, not quite. Wonderful. I would love to continue this discussion all night, but unfortunately we have run out of time. Crosstalks will be back on February 19th with more great minds and intelligent discussions. Be sure to check in at crosstalks.tv for updates on topics and guests. Until then, be safe and be brave.